All right, church. Um, today we're going to be in Joshua chapter 20 and 21. We're going to be covering both chapters, and I titled today's message, Tying Up Loose Ends. And Isaac mentioned something earlier that's, I think, what we're all trying to do in our lives, right? There's always some kind of loose end uh, here or there, and, you know, it's always great to try to tie those loose ends. And that's what we're going to be seeing Joshua do in these two chapters. All right, so far, all the tribes have received their allotments, their um, territories, and everyone's excited, everyone is, is, is happy, they finally made it, and they're receiving the promise. So now that all the 12 tribes had received their territories east and west of the Jordan River, it was now, final, there's two more final items that remained that needed to be taken care of. I don't have the map up, but again, some of your Bibles, most of your Bibles will have a map in the back of, you know, uh, jo the book of Joshua, the, the 12 tribes or lands, and I'll be mentioning some of the cities today, but there were two more final items that needed to be take taken care of now that the uh, tribes have received their lands east to west of the Jordan. And that would be which cities would be designated as cities, cities of refuge and which ones would be Levitical cities. Now this here goes all the way back when the nation was still wandering in the wilderness. See, God had told Moses in Exodus chapter 21 and Numbers chapter 35 to have the people set aside these special cities. And so now, again, that the tribes had received, had received their land allotments, Joshua can now assign those cities. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. In chapter 20, we're going to be covering the cities of refuge. We're going to see what those are. Uh, the cities of refuge are announced. And in chapter 21, the cities, the Levitical cities are designated. As you'll soon see, as I'll, soon, you'll, uh, as I'll share with you in, in just a bit, both of these chapters provide valuable insight that will be applicable to you and your lives and your walk as a believer, and also together as a church, as a church family here. And so, again, we're going to be looking at how Joshua will be tying up loose ends. So before I begin Joshua chap reading Joshua chapter 20, let's pray once more and ask the Lord to speak to us through his word. Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful this morning that you've given us life, you've given us breath, Lord, that we're able to feel, feel the chilly breeze. It's all because of your grace. We're so thankful for that. And so now as we come together as a church to, to read your word, read Joshua chapter 20 and 21, I pray that you will speak to us through every word, every sentence, every part of this passage, Lord, and, and that it, it will tell us and speak to us individually and in the things that we need to know, but also as a church, to be able to grow closer and just be a tighter-knit church, Lord. So, again, as Isaac prayed earlier, I pray that you remove all distractions, that right now we just sit at your feet and hear the beautiful words of 
this book. Keep us safe right now, Lord, and we look forward to what, you, what you're going to do. Pray this. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Joshua chapter 20. This chapter only has nine verses. I think it is the shortest chapter in this book, uh, or second shortest, but let me read that chapter in its entirety. Joshua chapter 20, verse 1, and the Word of God says, Then the Lord spoke to Joshua, Tell the Israelites, select your cities of refuge, as I instructed you through Moses, so that the person who kills someone unintentionally or accidentally may flee there. These will be your refuge from the avenger of blood. When someone flees to one of these cities, stands at the entrance of the city gate, and states his case before the elders of that city, they are to bring him into the city and give him a place to live among them. And if the avenger of the blood pursues him, they must not hand the one over who, the one who committed the one who committed manslaughter over to him. For he killed his neighbor accidentally and did not hate him beforehand. He is to stay in that city until he stands trial before the assembly and until the death of the high priest serving at that time. And the one who committed manslaughter may return home to his own own city from which he fled. So they designated Kadesh, Kadesh, in the hill country of Naphtali, in Galilee, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, in Kirith Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. Across the Jordan east of Jericho, they selected Bezer on the wilderness plateau from Reuben's tribe, Ramoth in Gilead from Gad's tribe, and Golan in Bashan from Manasseh's tribe. These are the cities appointed for all the Israelites and the aliens residing among them, so that anyone who kills a person unintentionally may flee there and not die at the hand of the avenger of blood until he stands before the assembly. One of the first ordinances ordinances after the announcements, after the announcement of the Ten Commandments provided for the future establishment of the cities of refuge there in Exodus 21. These cities, which were to provide a safe haven for a person who kills someone unintentionally or accidentally, they're discussed in detail in Numbers 35 and Deuteronomy chapter 19, if You want to read more into into that. Now, the fact that these cities are discussed in four books of the Old Testament, that ought to tell us of their great importance. You see, it's apparent that God wished to impress on on Israel the sanctity of human life put an end to a person's life, even if done unintentionally, in God's eyes, is still a serious thing. And so our omniscient, our wonderful, wonderful, all-knowing God directed Moses to set up a judicial system that would address cases of, un, of unpremeditated killing. Even before the law of Moses was given, God laid down the basic rule in Genesis chapter 9 that those who shed blood should pay for their crime with their own blood. But as I mentioned already in these passages, Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, Numbers 35, 
and Deuteronomy chapter 19, God made a distinction between murder and manslaughter. In the case of murder, the nearest family member, the next of kin, became the avenger of blood and could avenge the death by executing the murderer. For example, if someone accidentally knocked a person over the top of their house and they cracked their head, you know, that's, that's an example there. Or they dropped something on that person that was too heavy and that person died. I mean, I can give you a bunch of examples of unintention, things that can happen unintentionally. Now, if something like that happened, then there was a danger that an enraged avenger could execute the killer before a trial could actually take place. Now, in the case of unintentional killing, we see here in this chapter that the, de- that the offender could flee to the nearest of the six cities of refuge. The state is purpose at the gate where business transactions and judicial discords took place and request permission to enter the city by pleading his case to the elders there. The elders, after listening to the story, the whole situation to the testimony of the accidentally kill, accidental killer were to weigh its sincerity and truthfulness. If they determined the killing was, was actually unintentional, then they would admit the offender into the city and provide him a place to live. If, on the other hand, the elders determined that the killing had been committed out of hate and therefore was intentional or premeditated, they would not admit that person into the city. The avenger of blood could thus take revenge on the slayer and be exonerated. The avenger's homicide would be justified. I'll get more into that in just a minute, but see then in verses 7 through 9 what those six cities were. Those six cities are designated and they were located on both sides of the Jordan River. All six cities were conveniently located for the two and a half tribes east of the Jordan and the nine and a half tribes west of the Jordan. And also they were elevated and easy for for the fleeing uh, spiller of blood. Be easy for them to locate and and to reach. Uh, Once receiving the favor of the elders, the fleeing, the, the elders of the city of refuge, the offender would be put under protective custody for as long as the offender remained there. Now, there was only one way the offender could leave that city safely. And that stipulation was that he had to stay there until the current high priest in that city had died. Or over Israel, I'm sorry, over Israel had died. When that occurred, then... Then and only then could the slayer return home without jeopardizing his life. However, if the offender left the city while the current high priest was alive, even if he did so for a very short period of time, the avenger of the blood was within his rights to slay the offender. Accepting this person, it took a great deal of faith for those who lived in those cities. It took a lot of trust. 
even though the people there may have been good, law-abiding citizens and, you know, well-respected among their tribes and among entire Israel, they had to be willing to accept killers as their neighbors, as neighbors. That there was an act of grace. And I hope you see all that. By accepting that killer was an act of grace. And this here is where I want to show you how these cities of refuge have strong connections and symbolism to our faith as Christians. You see, just as the killer faced threat, the threat of death at the hand of the avenger without them, the sinner faces the threat without those cities of refuge. The, sin, the sinner faces the threat of... Let me repeat that. Just as the killer faced the threat of death at the hand of the avenger without them, the sinner faces the threat of spiritual death at the final judgment. See, because of our sin, and all of us have sinned, all of you have sinned, we deserve to die. We deserve the punishment of death. And we've also, because of that sin, those sins, separated from God. And as I said, all human beings, doesn't matter where you come from, where you're at, you know, how you were raised, even if you think that you're the most religious person, every single person has sinned, whether pre-meditatively or unintentionally. In fact, David says in Psalm 51.5, Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived, conceived me. Also, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, and Romans chapter 5, Verse 15, we're told that sin, that sin came through one man, Adam. Christ, the second Adam, came to become sin in order to take the penalty of sin, death, which humanity should have received. And so in knowing this and being aware of this, I, can ho I hope you can see the urgency in this matter. See, at that time, the, when this, we see the story here, the slayer, he wasn't supposed to be casual or nonchalant about seeking asylum from the avenger's blood. No, that slayer, that person was to flee Immediately, right away, no hesitation, he was supposed to go. The same is true for the sinner. Friends, cannot stress this enough. Tell you that sin, sin is a serious matter and repentance for sin must be immediately employed. It has to be done. If you sinned, even if it was this past week, even if it was today, before you got here, it's necessary and important that you come before the Lord and ask Him to forgive you. Don't hesitate. Don't wait and say, oh, you know what, I'm just going to wait until the end of the month until I can collect all my sins and, <laughs> and give it to the Lord. No, that's not how it works. 
We're supposed to come to him when we sin. I can't tell you how many times I came to him this week. So many times. Keep that in mind. It's urgent. Why is why should sin be immediate or I'm sorry, repentance be for sin be immediately employed? Because especially if you're if you haven't received Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you're not born again, death. Death can happen at any moment. You don't know if you're still going to be alive five minutes from now, ten minutes from now, after this service is over, when you, at the end of the day, you sure you've heard the stories of how quickly a life can end, especially, you know, if you're watching news from what's going on around the world, but even the news here even locally. People are dying every day, and do you think they were expecting it? Not unless they were, again, sick and on their deathbeds and already preparing for, for it. For the most part, it happens unexpectedly. It can happen at any moment and close the door on the opportunity for salvation. And as a believer, just to not come before the Lord and, and say, hey, you know, and the Lord asked, you could have, how come you didn't ask for forgiveness? I would have given it to you. you know, don't let that door close. If you have any sin that you haven't repented from, don't let that door close. Ask him to forgive you, and he will. The author of the book of Hebrews said this in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed for people to die once. And after this, judgment. So don't hesitate. Go there right away. But here also are four, four points that you can take and learn from this chapter, every sinner at this very moment have one place of refuge. There were only six designated cities in which protective rules could be employed and enforced for a person who has accidentally killed an individual. If the slayer ran to a city not listed in the city's of refuge directory, the slayer would have no protection from the avenger of blood. Likewise, the only protection a person has from eternal damnation and separation from God is Christ. Many of you guys, many of you guys and gals know what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6. And if you don't, let me tell you what he said there. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. So I hope you can see through that, that the proclamation of the gospel, the good news must always include the exclusivity of Christ. Or it's not the gospel. If you add anything to that, it's not the gospel. Again, it must always include the exclusivity of Christ. He alone, no one else. Another thing we can learn from this chapter, every sinner, every sinner 
can see Christ. Just as the six cities of refuge were conveniently located, reachable, and easy to get to, the cross at Calvary, at Golgotha, is visible from here, here to the other end of the world. If you know what I mean. Everybody and anybody, it's accessible to everybody. Anybody could see it. Anybody could see that cross. Again, let me quote Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 14 and 12, 32. He said this, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And as for me, I am lifted up from the earth. I will draw all people to myself. Not just a select few, not just a special few, but all. All people to myself. So, look and live, my brother and sister in Christ. Look to Jesus Christ and live. Christ is conveniently, com Christ is convenient and available all over the world through the gospel as the spoken word, the Bible as the written word, and Christ as the revealed word. Third, every sinner can obtain liberty in the death of Christ. As the death of the high priest over Israel announced freedom for the slayer to officially leave without penalty of death, so the death of Christ, our high priest, brought life and liberty to sinners. And not only did Christ, our high priest, die in our place, through the act of substitutionary atonement as our kinsman redeemer, he also rose from the dead for our justification. God's justice required perfection, which sinners could not produce. And as a result, as a result, we receive the death penalty. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Beautiful. But here also lies the redemptive reversal. Christ paid our wages, that is death, and we received his gift, eternal life, by simply trusting in him. Simply trusting in him. And fourth, every sinner every sinner who repents they will be accepted it doesn't matter if you're in death row right now it doesn't matter if you just finished stealing a pen at walmart every sinner who repents will be accepted the cities of refuge were places of inclusivity for all accidental offenders who lived in, excuse me, in the Israelite community. Hebrews, the mixed multitude who came out of Exodus, 
with Israel, strangers and foreigners like Rahab, her family who, whose family were spared at Jericho, and the Gibeonites who were also spared due to an oath made in God's name, they again were there. They were, the, they were included. God rescued Israel, saved them. They were part of that. Again, a mixed multitude. Someone well-known wrote this. This was, an entire, this was entirely new to the heathen world. Here was real justice, a universal civil code that pertained equally to the citizen and the stranger. This justice was not rooted in the notion of a superior people, but in the character of God. So just to recap, if you're watching this and listening, recap those four points. Sinners have one place of refuge. Sinners can see Christ. Sinners can obtain liberty in the death of Christ. And sinners, a sinner who repents, will be accepted. Friends, again, if you're watching this, you will be accepted. You just come to him. Come to Jesus and make him your Lord and Savior. At the end of this message, I will give you an opportunity to do that. But don't let another day pass. Don't let that door close. Because close. you'll never know if you'll have another. You'll never know if you can have 10 minutes, 10 more minutes. So I urge you, Run, flee to the arms of Jesus. For us as a church, these cities of refuge are a picture of the church. As a church, we should be welcoming. Too often, so many churches are guilty of scrutinizing certain individuals in their midst. However, Jesus called his disciples to be what? Fishers of men. He didn't call them to be, you know, you just get, get bass and that's it. No, fishers, any kind of fish, whatever you get. Be the ugliest, worst tasting kind of fish can be the most undesirable fish I told them to be fishers of men it'd be welcoming and not scrutinizing regardless of how they look how they dress what kind of lifestyle they've lived it's not our job to judge. It's not our role. It's up to God. Our role is just to share the love of Christ, to share Jesus. It's His word. It's Him, His power, His love, His grace that changes hearts, changes lives, transforms relationships. It's all him. You can tell them till you're blue in the face that they need to repent, need to repent. But they've got to understand it themselves. They've got to come to that place of needing that forgiveness. Think back when you were at your worst, when you were that stubborn sinner. I don't even my wife couldn't convince me to Turn back to the Lord. No, he had to break me down into a million little, little pieces. Had to be shattered. Had to be broken before I had. That was, but that's just me. 
It's different for different people. Again, it doesn't matter if someone's five, or someone's 99, or 199. Again, we have to be welcoming and loving. Again, oftentimes, we as disciples, we try to clean the fish before we catch them. We question their backgrounds, backgrounds, investigate their friends, police their clothes. And they come and want to become part of the church here, the local church. We categorize them by what they say, what others say of them, what social media, what they have on their social media, or what we might know of them, word of, or maybe even word of mouth. We forget to apply the same grace of which we're beneficiaries. We forget to apply that to others. We forget that the hospital, I mean, that the church is a hospital for the sick. It's a hospital for the sick, my friends. Don't forget that. We forget our duty to disciple. We forget our duty to disciple, not to disgrace or disqualify. Let me repeat that. We forget our duty to disciple, not to disgrace or disqualify. Remembering this was even difficult for the early church who hesitated to accept the Apostle Paul. Even Ananias, Ananias questioned God when the Lord sent him to Straight Street in Damascus to minister to him. Later, Barnabas would have to speak up for the man and vouch for him before the other apostles would accept him at Jerusalem. Again, my friends, Jesus died to save sinners regardless of what their it's ethnic, regardless of their ethnicities their creeds or colors economic background their social background regardless of where they came from how they were raised whether they grew up the silver spoon or whether they were born over there in Segundo Barrio. Again, he died to save sinners. Do you understand that the kingdom of heaven will mirror the picture of the diversity of the church? This is something that John saw. He observed this when he was in heaven. He said this in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So again, let us be an example here. Let us be an example of what it's going to be like in the kingdom of heaven. I seriously hope you don't have any biases or prejudices on, against anyone because of their skin color, because a disability, because of, you know, whether they have money or, or not. You just, again, would include them, and they will feel loved here in the church. If I see it, I'll say something. More than likely, I'll probably tell you, hey, take, you know, let's talk. If it gets bad, I'll probably say, hey, you know what? Find a way to serve that person, love that person. I will encourage you before I actually have to, you know, resort to any crazy measures, but... Again, 
I will be one to always promote loving. Loving that person that is still struggling with a homosexual lifestyle, struggling with a person who's still struggling with gender identity, struggling that person who no one wants to be around. So again, I hope that in this chapter you saw things that you can learn at, as an individual, as, as a believer, and as a church. So let me, all right, let me try. Chapter 21, chapter 21. Joshua chapter 21. Joshua 21. The Levite family, the Levite family heads approached the priest Eleazar, Joshua son of Nun, and the family heads of the Israelite tribes at Shiloh in the land of Canaan. They told them, the Lord commanded through Moses that we be given cities to live in with, with their pasture lands for our livestock. So the Israelites, by the Lord's command, gave the, Levite, the Levites these cities with their pasture lands from their inheritance. The lot came out for the Korahite clans, the Levites, who were the descendants of the priests, Aaron, received 13 cities by lot from the tribes of Judah, Simeon, and Benjamin. The remaining descendants of Kohath received 10 cities by lot from their clans of the tribes of Ephraim, Dan, and half the tribe of Manasseh. Gershon's descendants received 13 cities by lot from the clans of the tribes of Issachar, Asher, Naphtali, and half the tribe of Manasseh and Bashan. Merari's descendants received 12 cities for their clans from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Zebulun. The Israelites gave these cities with their pasture lands ar around them to the Levites by lot as the Lord had commanded them through Moses. The Israelites gave these cities by name from the tribes of the descendants of Judah and Simeon to the descendants of Aaron, Aaron from the Kohathite clans of the Levites because they received the first lot. They gave them Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak with its surrounding pasture lands in the hill country of Judah. But they gave the fields and settlements of the city to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and his possessions, as his possessions. They gave to the descendants, to the priest Aaron, Hebron, the city of refuge, to the one who commits manslaughter with his pasture lands, Libna with his pasture lands, Jatir with its, pa its pasture lands, Eshtemoa with its pasture lands, Holon with its pasture lands, Debir with its pasture lands, Ain, Ain with its pasture lands, Juta with its pasture lands, and Beth Shemesh with its pasture lands. Nine cities from these two tribes. From the tribe of Benjamin, they gave Gibeon with its pasture lands, Geba with its pasture lands, Anathoth with its pasture lands, and Almon with its pasture lands. Four cities. All 13 cities with their pasture lands were for their priest, were for the priests, the descendants of Aaron. The allotments to the cities, the allotments to cities, Lotted cities to the remaining cl clans of Kohath, the descendants who were Levites, came from the tribe of Ephraim. The Israelites gave them Shechem, the city of refuge for the one who commits manslaughter with its pasture lands in the hill country of Ephraim, Gezer with its pasture lands, Kabzaim with its pasture lands, and Beth Haran with its pasture lands. Four cities. From the tribe of Dan, they gave Altiki with his pasture lands, Gibbethon with his pasture lands, Aijalon with his pasture lands, and Gath Ramon with its pasture lands. Four cities. From half the tribe of Manasseh, half the tribe of Manasseh, they gave Tanakh with its pasture lands, and Gath Rimmon with its pasture lands. Two cities. All ten cities with their pasture lands 
were for the clans of Kohath's other descendants. Almost done. Again. From half the tribe of Manasseh, they gave to the descendants of Gershon, who were only one, who were one of the Levite clans. Golan, city of refuge for the one who commits manslaughter with its pasture lands in Bashan and Bishtharon. Bishthara, with his pasture lands, two cities. And the tribe of Issachar, they gave Kishion with his pasture lands, Dabarath with his pasture lands, Jarmuth with his pasture lands, and, and En Ganim with his pasture lands, four cities. From the tribe of Asher, they gave Mishal with his pasture lands, Abdon with his pasture lands, Helkath with his pasture lands, and Rehob with his pasture lands, four cities. From the tribe of Nephtali, they gave Kadesh in Galilee, the city of refuge, for the one who commits manslaughter with his pasture lands, Hamoth Dor with his pasture lands, and Kar Kartan with his pasture lands, three cities. All 13 cities with their pasture lands were for the Gershonites by their clans. From the tribe of Zebulun, they gave to the clans of the descendants of Merari, who were, the who were the remaining Levites. Jachnim with his pasture lands, Karta with his pasture lands, Dimna with his pasture lands, and Ahal with its pasture lands, four cities. From the tribe of Reuben, they gave Bezer with its pasture lands, Jaza with its pasture lands, Kedema with its, Kedemoth with its pasture lands, and Mephtha, Mep, Mephath with its pasture lands, four cities. From the tribe of Gad, they gave Ramoth and Gilead, the city of refuge, for the one who commits manslaughter with his pasture lands. Mahanim with his pasture lands, Heshbon with his pasture lands, and Jezer with his pasture lands. Four cities in all. All 12 cities were allotted to the clans of Merari's descendants, the remaining Levite clans. Within the Israelite possession, there were 48 cities in all with their pasture lands for the Levites. Each of these cities had its, had its own surrounding pasture lands. This was true for all the cities. Verse 43. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their fathers, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side according to all he had sworn to their fathers. None of, the, none of their enemies were able to stand against them. For the Lord handed over all their enemies to them, None of the good promises of the Lord had made, none of the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. Everything was fulfilled. Once again, thank you for bearing with all that and bearing with me the, name, the names. promise I'm not going to go through every single one of the names I mean I could but it's a, a study maybe I recommend you to do and chapter 21 chapter 21 begins by telling us that the heads of the Levite families approached Eleazar the high priest Joshua son of Nun and the heads of the other families other tribal families of Israel they had come to Shiloh the place of worship and reminded the leaders of what Moses had said about gathering towns as residential areas for the Levites and pasture lands for their li livestock. Well, in Scripture, throughout Scripture, God repeatedly admonishes His people to remember, to remember not to forget. In this book, in this book of Joshua, Remembering was extremely important. What God said through Moses is, oh, is always recalled so the promises might be executed and completed within the present time of the Israelite occupation. So Joshua and his leaders will obey Moses who had received the commandments and directions from the Lord. History must always be an accounting and recounting 
of His story. It must be an accounting and recounting of His story. As believers, as Christians, we are granted roles in His story of grace. And so this arrangement for the Levites was executed without rancor, complaints, or selfishness. From the larger tribes like Judah and Ephraim to the smaller tribes of Asher and Naphtali, cities were granted to the Levites. Every single tribe contributed to the needs of the Levitical tribe. And I hope you know where this is leading. Likewise, as believers, we must also do the same. We're called to care for one another's needs. I know it can be very easy to walk out of these doors and not know or be aware of the needs of the person sitting next to you. But as a believer, as a Christian, you should. You should be aware and care for the needs of others. In the New Testament church, if you remember, early on in the church, everyone must contribute to the needs or had to contribute to the needs of the ministry and the saints of the congregation, regardless of congregational demographics. Paul instructed the members of the Corinthian church to conduct, conduct themselves in the following manner regarding giving. There, here in, uh, there in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now about the collection for the saints. Do the same as I instructed the Galatian churches. On the first day of the week, each of you set, aside, set, each of you set something aside and save in keeping with how he is pros prospering so that no collections will need to be made when I come. Just as, the, just as the tribes gave some of, the, of their allotments to the Levites, believers, every single one of us, every single one of you, must be willing to share with those in need. And especially, especially within the household. the Lord. The household of faith. During the first hasty battle with Ai, the city appeared to have stood together before Israel. Didn't the men of Ai fight the Israelites and kill 60, 36 of them? Thus putting Israel to a retreat, basically kicking their butts. Yeah. But the problem wasn't that the men of AI, it wasn't the, pro the problem wasn't the men of AI standing before the Israelites. It was the Israelites' failure to stand before God. Believers, as believers, we can learn much about the daily, about daily failures and successes. Our calling is to come and stand before our Father in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, the Christ, in the name of Jesus, we stand before God the Father, in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the, whole, in the power of the Holy Spirit, with every issue or concern in our lives. When we fail to stand before God like we fail to stand before God like children, for a loving, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent Father. Then we invite 
the inability to stand. Then we invite the inability to, to stand, to attend our way. My point being here again, as a church, let's help one another out. If you know a need, don't ignore it. Obviously, again, we know you may have limited resources as well, time and resources, but maybe there is a way you can help. And if you do need the help, that's great. But don't abuse it. And we, church wants to love and help. But I've seen so many times how people can abuse that. It's a balance there. Again, the point being, know what your neighbor needs, especially your neighbor that's sitting next to you here at church. So as 40, 41 states, I won't go through all the clans again, all the names, but as 41, verse 41 states, a total of 48 cities with their pasture lands, including the cities of refuge, were assigned to the Levites as the Lord had commanded. Every tribe gave four cities except for Judah and Simeon, and Simeon who gave nine cities between them and Naphtali, which gave three cities. The cities of refuge, being cities of the Levites, were scattered throughout all the tribes of Israel to fulfill the prophecy of Jacob there in Genesis chapter 49 and to better facilitate their teaching ministry to the nation. Now, verse 43, verse 43 there, it, it must be read in the light of other scripture. It's important. It doesn't mean that Israel occupied all the land from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. No. Instead, it means that the land which Joshua divided was in fulfillment of God's promise that he would give them every place that their soul, the soul of their feet, walked upon. Likewise, verse 44 must be interpreted carefully. There were still enemies within the land. Not all the Canaanites had been destroyed. That wasn't God's fault. He fulfilled his promise by defeating every foe against which the Israelites fought. Israelites fought. If, there was, if there were still undefeated foes, and pockets of resistance it was because Israel did not claim God's promise. This chapter then concludes with an affirming note. Not one, not one, from a, from a minor chord, but from a major chord, that's the affirming note. Not one, let me repeat that. This chapter then concludes with, on an affirming note. Not one from a minor chord, but from a major chord. After seven years of continuous combat, military combat in Canaan, there was finally rest and victory for the Israelites. The victory and rest came as a result of God's fulfilling the promise he made to his people. Verse 45 provides us also with one of the greatest texts in the whole book of Joshua. And in fact, some will say the entire Bible. I will say it's up there to the last words of Jesus. But it says there, not one word, not one word failed. Not one word of his promises failed. How could a word fail coming from the one who said, 
Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our God is faithful. And as Paul spoke to Titus, in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, our God, your God, is a God who cannot lie. We have confidence in our inheritance because the person who's given it to us, the guarantor, created and owns all that is, has been, and will ever be. Through the death of Christ, my friends, our high priest, we receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, who was the deposit guaranteeing our spiritual inheritance from God the Father. Let me also tell you this. God's promises must, they must come to pass. They must. If you were to take an honest look at your own life, each and every one of you, take an honest look at your own life and, and reflect on the promises that the Lord has made to each and every one of you. I'm certain that you can testify that God has been faithful and has fulfilled so far every one of them. Still a lot more that he's going to fulfill. He may not have fulfilled all of them, but so far he has fulfilled his promises to you. I'm not talking about, you know, if you think he promised you that he'll give you a Lamborghini. I'm not talking about that, but I think you know what I'm, what I'm saying with that. God's faithfulness in the past gives us assurances in the future. We, like the Levites, can rest knowing that every need will be met. You, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we can stand on the promises of God. We can stand on them. He's not fickle. He's not, you know, his promises aren't they're rock solid. They are rock solid. They're not sand and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm picturing, you know, the, the beach when you're standing on the sand against the water, how your toes just start. No, it's not like that. His promises aren't like that. His promises are rock solid. So we can stand on them. So let me close it up, summarizing our, this chapter. God kept his promises. At the close of his life, Joshua would remind the people of this. And Solomon reminded them of it when he dedicated the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56. And so as the people of God, we can claim these assurances by faith. God's covenant with us isn't going to fail. God's power and wisdom can give you victory over every foe. And God's promises can, let me repeat that, can be trusted no matter what the circumstances may be. My brothers and sisters, the covenant of God, the power of God, the promises of God, these are spiritual resources we can depend on as we claim our inheritance in Christ Jesus. So now let me go back to what I mentioned earlier. Those of you watching and listening and you now recognize your spiritual need and you need, you understand you need these spiritual resources and you want to stand on God's promises and you want this new life that 
you've been hearing about so often and that the Lord has been speaking to you about through his word, maybe through friends and through a tract you might have seen. I want to tell you now, you can. You can receive it today. As I said, it doesn't matter if you're sitting on death row right now or where you, wherever you're at, you can come to him and he will give you eternal life. He will save you and rescue you from sin and death. He will forgive you of all your sins, no matter how bad they are. So if that's what you like, if that's what you want, let me, I want to invite you to the cross and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But don't let another day pass. Don't say, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it whenever the next crusade comes or the next message. As I said, you just don't know. You don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen after you hear this message. You could be in a foxhole right now somewhere around the world. Come to the cross and be assured of your salvation. Have that assurance. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and with all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I now believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me, forgiving me, and saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.